I'm sure that you will come out with uh, a lot of answers, hopefully. And if you have more questions, we are happy to help. So there will be plenty of opportunity for you guys to engage with the team, uh, the support team, and uh, ask questions and, and even have sessions in one-to-one. -one. So we'll announce soon, we'll have a clinic, what we call a clinic, which means that you can book an appointment and sit with one of our scientists and he can walk you through uh, whatever specifics uh, of your issues. So um, the agenda today will go through pretty much of everything, but a little bit of everything. Uh, we'll go through an overview of the cluster, what is IBEX and what it has, how to get access to it. So for those who don't have access, uh, the, the software stack, the modules, and how to interact with the system uh, with the job scheduler. We will cover a couple of applications. So uh, bi uh, biology is one of the major workloads on IBEX, but also chemistry and others. Um, we will cover some of that and we'll come by the best practices. Um, all right. So I probably didn't introduce myself. I'm Saber Feki, the senior computational scientist team lead at the Supercomputing Core Lab. We are part of the 10 core labs uh, on campus and uh, we provide the services and training. Uh, our mission is to provide the state of the art facilities, but also training like today and support to our student, faculty, all researchers in campus, their collaborators worldwide and try to serve also the needs in the kingdom. And we aim to become a world-class reference in supercomputing. So in terms of facility, we have outstanding facility that is getting refreshed in a very uh, agile way to get the latest technology available. And you will see that, especially on IBEX. And uh, we provide all of these kind of services from infrastructure to the expertise of the team who will be helping and supporting and enabling the research, enabling the science and discovery. So we provide the co computing cycles, so the, the time on the machine, uh, but also the consultancy in terms of how you use the machine. We educate and train people to efficiently and effectively run their science and get uh, from time to solution as fast as possible. And finally, and but not least, is we build the community around it. So we have this community of users. We have a Slack. Uh, we also have workshops and conferences where we get together and we we help each other to 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 get to our targets. Um, and then we provide these new value added services that we try to provide on a regular basis. Uh, year after year where we tackle specific problems sometimes for the specific user but sometimes what we noticed is the the solution can propagate to many users so let's say we help a pipeline of biology and then that pipeline can apply not only to human genome but also to plants and other genomes uh, we have for example a tool that is we developed here at KAUST called decimate that handles large amount of jobs initially designed for the weather models, but then it, it, it was used for chemistry and biology and many other science areas, seismic as well. So this kind of uh, value added services. Uh, so I will go through the IBEX overview, uh, but uh, today the good thing is uh, we, we get your feedback. So after this training, you will get a feedback form to give us feedback. One of the feedback in previous sessions of IBEX 101 from your colleague is to have hands on. So some experience in touching the system, having some experience to, to submit a job and so on. So we have some details on those hands on and hopefully the team will guide you through some of the examples and testing yourself. So we'll be communicating with Slack and then we will have on the system uh, a reservation of resources, computing resources to use, uh, and then a, a folder where you can see the examples. So what is IBEX? So it, it, as every supercomputer, the cluster is basically uh, built by a large number of nodes. Uh, these are computing nodes, the computing capability. Uh, which are CPUs or GPUs or the mix of that. So we will talk exactly about the details of that. And then a storage system uh, that is uh, connected to it through the network, typically. It's very light laser. 
Um, and then how you interact with that is through this login nodes and scheduler. So that's the key part where uh, you can interact with the system with. So this login nodes is where you get into the system, you prepare your code, you prepare your scripts, interact with the scheduler, and then you can submit your jobs. So this is Chinese for now, but as we go through the training, you will see these steps one by one, how to log in, get to the login nodes, and then prepare your scripts, submit the jobs, and then the job gets scheduled in the computational resources as you requested them. So we will hear all about that. So in my part of this training, I will tackle the yellow and green, the storage and compute part, and then the, the interaction and the software piece will be tackled by uh, my team. So on, in terms of infrastructure, so the Intel, so we have multiple uh, kind of CPUs and GPU nodes. So we have Intel and AMD. So Intel, Skylake and Cascade Lake uh, here, which are the latest uh, at that time when we installed them. So these are 40 cores uh, kind of nodes with 384 gig. Uh, we seen, we've seen the, the AMD bumping up the number of cores as well as the memory. So we installed lately 100, AMD ROM nodes with 128 cores each. So that's a lot of cores, right? Uh, with 512 gig of memory, even 512 gig of memory, sometimes it's not sufficient for some of the applications like genome assembly, for example, we got 18 of three terabytes memory each. Uh, these nodes are very useful for very specific workloads. And if you need them, you can have access to those as well. Um, the latest comer in, 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 the, in IVEX is the AI. Since last three years, we have a huge growth in AI and GPU computing. So we've been increasing our capacity dramatically from 32 GPUs. Now we have 400 roughly. Uh, out of those, we have a large number of the high-end V100 GPUs. These are the Voltas. They have 32 gig of high bandwidth memory and a lot of local memory as well. Um, the good news is that even that it seems to be not sufficient for the AI community and the GPU computing community. So we added the latest ingredients, which is the A100, the Ampere, with 80 gig of high bandwidth memory, uh, and that is coming up soon. So we have it, uh, it's already shipped, it's in the data center, I was just there, and we are building them, connecting them to the system, and uh, working out the software now at this moment. So that's the hardware piece uh, in terms of computing capability. Now we go to the storage. Uh, in terms of storage, we have a variety of storage to address different needs. We have a fast storage for now, it's a small and limited, but we are targeting an upgrade in the next six months or so, where we are gonna uh, have in this fast storage additional capacity. So, Storage is one of the key things because that's where your data sits, right? Um, and if, if you have a very slow storage, you will spend time in moving data from the storage to the compute because it's network attached. It's not like your computer where you have the disk attached to the system. So this is network attached. Uh, so we go for very high bandwidth network and I will talk about a network connectivity, but also the storage medium needs to be really, really fast. We're talking gigabytes kind of speed. Um, up to terabytes per second, uh, potentially, but uh, that's on Shaheen, we have that, but for IBEX, we have hundreds of gigabytes per second in terms of bandwidth, and that is really important for data intensive workloads. So we, we started with, uh, with a small fast scratch, but we have also the BGFS scratch, the 2.3 petabytes uh, storage, that's, that's still sizable. But then we have a plan to upgrade both the fast scratch, but also the project storage with much more capacity. So we are planning to increase capacity. For people who are working with very sensitive data, okay, um, for example, human genomes, uh, the ethic committee dictate to us to use encrypted storage, and we have this capability as well. So we got a four petabyte specifically for this kind of applications. Uh, of course, once you land in your system, uh, in your login nodes, all the, the initial files that you will start working on will be in your home directory. 
and that's available and it has you will have 200 gigabytes of quota on that it's plenty where you can save all your source codes and so on the data will be on the scratch and project space all right now how to glue all these things together uh, because as i mentioned you the, the the storage is network attached and there are different nodes they need to talk to each other they need to work to each uh, with each other to tackle very large uh, problems in science and technology so what we did is we provisioned a very high end network connectivity between these components which is the infiniband hdr uh, director switch it connects up to 200 gigabits per second so that's very fast but not only speed but also a very low latency so we are the sub three microseconds in terms of latency then we have ethernet which is the traditional connectivity at uh, on the campus to the backbone network and it connect used to different parts of the net campus including uh, devices like the cryo electronic microscopy or the biology sequencers so we get data directly from there to the ibex that where it gets processed so I think that's all that I have. Any questions at this moment, or we can go to the, we'll go to the software piece, but any question on the hardware? All good. All right, thank you so much. And then we move on to the next parts where we get access and then we use IBEX. Um, remember that this is the first time we came back after the uh, COVID, so, in the last session we were online, so we are still now transitioning from fully face-to-face -to, -face to a hybrid. Some of the uh, work will be on videos that we already recorded. Some of the presentations will be live. So it's still hybrid in all aspects. Um, hopefully next year it will be fully face-to-face -face and live. Um, the good thing is the, all these videos, you will be uh, stored uh, in an accessible place where you can revise them and you can go back to the material as well as the slide in our website and our YouTube channel. So, Thank you, Sabe. Um, after this um, wonderful introduction to um, IBEX hardware, now we'll go to the software side. And for that, we have some pre-recorded stuff and some live presentations. So we'll start with a... Um, pre-recorded uh, introduction to the software environment on IPEX by uh, Basant Hafiz. Uh, she's in the meeting, but uh, we'll play her recording. So um, let us know if you uh, see any issues uh, listening to it, uh, especially the attendees at Zoom. Now with the software environment overview, a question that we usually receive is that, do I need to apply for an account to use IBEX? The answer is simply no. Any KAUST member with valid KAUST credentials should be able to directly log in and use IBEX. To check the validity of your credentials, please try to log into either the KAUST
Now with the software environment overview, a question that we usually receive is that, do I need to apply for an account to use IVEX? The answer is simply no. Any CAUS member with valid CAUS credentials should be able to directly log in and use IVEX. To check the validity of your credentials, please try to log into either the CAUS portal or the web link. The portal looks something like this. You'll find the login part on your left. And the web mail looks like this. If for any reason you couldn't log in to these portals, or you could, but you couldn't log in to the cluster, please contact IT. If you experience multiple login failures, your account will be locked for 15 minutes. Please wait and then try again. If you still couldn't access your account, then please contact IT. So how to log into the cluster based on your operating system? For macOS and Linux users, you can use the native terminal program. You'll find it installed by default on both of these systems. For Microsoft Windows users, you'll need to use a third-party SSH client like Putty or Mobile Extreme. Please note that Mobile Extreme is an enhanced terminal which also runs an X11 server. Unlike Putty, you need to install that separately, something like Xming. Upon successful login, you'll find our message of the day. It contains any information or updates the team wants to share with you. For example, any upcoming maintenance sessions or the dates and times, so you can schedule your jobs accordingly. You'll also find any updates related to the app stack, like deprecating some set of apps. Upon your first login to the cluster, you'll receive a welcome email with, with some useful information, for example, your storage spaces, your home and your scratch, the size of each, you find our support channels. You'll also find some useful documents like the IBEX and Storm cheat sheets. Now with a quick overview on the software available on IBEX. Every user has two options. The first is to have a local installation so you can customize it as much as you can. The second option would be to ask for the installation and the IBEX team will work on having the most common or general mode of installation. The, the software on IBEX is managed through environment modules you find more than 400 modules available on different app stacks. The most common subcommands are the following. Module AV or avail with no arguments will list all the modules available for use. Module AV or avail with string is used to check the availability of a module that starts with that string. Module load or add will add that module to your environment. 
Mozil unload or RM or remove it from your environment. Module swap or switch swaps between two modules. Module purge will remove all the loaded modules from your current session. Module list will list the currently loaded modules. Module show views what the module is supposed to change in your environment. An example for module available with no arguments. Example for module avail CUDA, then module load one of the available CUDA modules. Module list will show that module. Module purge will remove everything. The module list again will show that you're currently not loading anything. For a module like Python 3.7.0, you can check what the module is going to change in your environment when you load it by module show Python 3.7.0. You find the environment variables that will be changed upon loading. Please note that some tools are already available on the system by default, like Python and GCC. So to make sure that you're using the loaded module, not the systems one, check, for example, which Python. That will print the full path to the Python binary that you'll be using when you type Python in your terminal. We can categorize our software stack based on different criteria by the processor type, by size domain, or by the module role. The software stack by processor. As you may know, IBEX is a hybrid cluster of different processors, Intel, AMD, and GPU. So the software stack can vary accordingly. For each type, there is a dedicated local node for the available software stack. To check the Intel software stack, login to ilogin.ibex.caust.edu.sa. For the GPU related software stack, login to glogin.ibex.caust.edu.sa. On IBEX, we have different modules for different science domains. For example, the biosciences, chemistry, CFD, deep learning, electrical engineering, and cryo-electron microscopy. The software stack by role, the module can be part of the software development or the libraries, or the applications, or a container. And for that, we use singularity. Thank you. So now we move on to uh, some demos. Uh, it might actually be a repetition, but uh, um, we'll go through the login process on three different operating systems, uh, uh, Microsoft uh, Windows, Linux, and Mac. So Aitan Smile is going to talk about them while there's a stream running. I am going to restart that. Uh, Aitan, are you ready? Yes, yes. Good morning, everyone. Um, the next three short demos uh, are to show you how to log into IBEX, iLogin, and GLogin using different operating systems. Um, we start with uh, Linux. This is how we open the terminal. Uh, we log into iLogin. Uh, where are uh, the CPUs? You can check the app stack for the iLogin CPU nodes. Uh, this is how to log into glogin, where the app stack for the GPUs are available. And we're in. Uh, 
the next short demo uh, is for Windows. I'm a Windows user. So I use uh, Mobile Xterm. You can also use Potty. Uh, I prefer Mobile Xterm because it has already the exploding uh, setup. You start the local terminal. Same as the uh, other demo. We log into iLogin. You write your username and at ilogin.ibex.cast.edu.sa. And we're in. The short demos will be shared. So uh, all users can uh, check out uh, this is how we log into glogin. And we're in. The next demo is to show you how to log in uh, from Mac. Also from the terminal. If anyone has any questions, there's the Q&A there for any questions anyone wants to ask. It's very easy. It's uh, these short demos are just to show you how to log in to iLogin and glogin. For example, this user does not have the keys stored on Ibex. That's why he's entering um, the password. Uh, there's a demo uh, shortly that will show you how to log into Ibex uh, um, using passwordless uh, SSH. So you will not need to enter your password each time. And we're in. Thank you. Uh, back to you, Mohsen. Thanks, Aitan. This was really, really helpful. Um, any questions on logging in? Uh, please do ask. Uh, for those who are on Zoom, please ask uh, in the Q&A box. And for those who are here, you're welcome to ask any question. Yes, please. Um, so um, uh, the question is about mobile Xterm. Uh, when you uh, mobile Xterm is an open source tool, and if you go to the mobile Xterm, if, if you Google it, it will take you to uh, the URL. There are two um, installations. I believe the portable one is the one that you need to click on, and then you can uh, download that and install if you have admin privileges on your computer. Yeah. Okay, now we move on to how to set passwordless uh, SSH. What that means basically is uh, you don't need to uh, type password every time you log in. Uh, you can, uh, this is optional. You can uh, just uh, ignore it, or if you're interested in it, here is a video on it. Uh, so Pasant half is, is going to uh, walk us through. So Pasant, you're up. Yes, Mohsen. Hello, guys.
So as uh, explained my, by my colleagues, uh, it's, it's easier and uh, maybe um, if you log into uh, a user system that um, uh, frequent, uh, you may benefit from uh, setting up SSH keys. So um, this, this is how you uh, SSH passwordlessly. So I'm now trying to log in the normal way. I, I didn't set the uh, keys, so it required my password. Now, what I'm gonna try to do is on my local machine, I use the command that uh, SSH keygen, key generate with the default settings. You can change that, add passphrase and any and all of that. In the local directory, I have a hidden directory is the .ssh. I have created two uh, forms of keys. One is the IDRSA, that's the private key. And the other is the ID rsa.pub, that's the public key. From the name, the public key is the one to be shared on the remote system. Then I use the command ssh copy ID and specifying that remote location will copy my public ID uh, by public key from the hidden directory to that remote uh, place. For this step only, I need to add my password. That should be done, copying the keys to the remote uh, target. Now I'll, I'll try to log in again, as I tried the first time. And voila. I hope it was clear, but if you have any questions or do you, if you need any more customization using passphrase or something, please let us know. So any question on passwordless um, SSH key setting? Cool. Um, let us move forward. And uh, well, now we are going to have a demo on the module system that is available on IBEX to discover the installed modules uh, that are uh, available on IBEX. By the way, all these uh, small videos, the live demos will be posted on YouTube. You can actually follow them in your own uh, uh, comfort. So I think Pasant is going to uh, narrate them. Uh, you're up again. So with this video, we're gonna show some uh, uh, examples for the module com commands as we explained in the first presentation. We'll just show how to navigate through the system and check different uh, installations, load and unload. The first command will be module avail. And uh, as we can see, it lists everything that's installed on this app stack, on this login node and the relevant nodes. Now, if I do a uh, module avail with a string, like Intel, it shows every available installation that starts with the word Intel. I'm gonna choose this one and do module load, which simply means activating this installation. Now with module list, I'm checking that in my environment or in this current session, I'm loading this module. Purge removes everything from the environment. So when I do list again, I have no module files loaded. Now having, for example, the GCC modules. With module show, I'm showing what the module is gonna change in the environment, the environment variables that will be altered, as you see the CC, the FC, the, the path to the binaries. 
if you're interested to know. Now with an example, uh, I'm loading a GSL installation that by default loads uh, a GCC uh, module as a dependency. Now what I'm gonna do is unload this GCC module, the dependency, and with module lists, now I'm showing that I only load the GSL. That helps if you have multiple modules loaded or if you have a dependence, dependency that you want to change, for example, using a different version of GCC, if that is supported with the same GSL installation. Now I'm unloading GSL and with the module list, it shows I'm not loading anything. So, so with one module, it's equivalent to the purge, as you may uh, um, get the idea. Now I loaded GSL again and with purge, I removed both modules, so nothing is loaded after purge. Now with an uh, uh, important um, um, verification, if you, if you want to check as we mentioned, if you there are available Python installations, for example, with different versions. Um, if you want to check if you're uh, using the system one because it's installed by default on the system, uh, there is a command called uh, which that prints the path to the binary uh, that's available. Uh, so when you load a module, uh, Python is added to the default uh, path of binaries. And it's the same if you're not loading any modules, you find Python by command, uh, for Python command by default on the system. So I check with which Python it prints the, uh, the path in slash USR. So uh, that's the default uh, location for the system installed uh, binaries. So this Python is, is the system installed one. I'm gonna now check the available Python installations on, on the app stack. I find multiple versions. So I'm loading one of these. I choose the 381. Now I'm doing the which Python again. It shows the Python under the slash SW. That's where our uh, software stack lies. Also, if you're using um, a Conda environment as that's the, the, the next presentation. You can do the same because Conda installs, uh, may install uh, Python too. So with which Python you can verify which installation you're using and it's very important and may um, lead to problems if it's not well set. Thanks everyone, I hope it was clear. And now the next presentation. Thanks percent, uh, this was really helpful. Any questions before we move on in terms of uh, interacting with modules or uh, choosing the right Python? Okay, uh, we're gonna be here after the presentation if you feel like uh, any confusion clarification. So now there is a snippet about how to install Miniconda in your environment. Miniconda is, uh, it's Conda, if you're unfamiliar, is another package manager, which deals with uh, primarily uh, Python and R packages. And these are pre-compiled binaries sitting somewhere in the cloud, um, and they are manifested by channels. They are pooled by channels, and uh, uh, they are, let's call it pre-cooked recipes of the workflows uh, the software environment for the workflows. So a lot of the times you will see um, installation um, instructions talking about Conda recipes and uh, Conda installations. Uh, for that, you need Conda package. And this is how you install Conda package in your own space, in your own directory, home directory on IBEX. Okay. So that was a bit of preface. Let's uh, uh, listen to Dr. David Pugh, who is actually going to talk about a GitHub uh, 
repository he has been maintaining uh, on Conda installation on IPEX, mini Conda installation on IPEX. So give me a second, I think. Need to. Webinar, I'm going to show you how to install Miniconda into your IBEX home directory. So, the first thing that you're going to want to do is go ahead and log in to IBEX. So, I've logged into IBEX in this terminal right over here. And the next thing you're going to need to do is open a web browser and visit this URL. So, this is the URL for the repository on GitHub that contains all of the uh, instructions and install and uninstall scripts that are required to kind of automate the process of installing Miniconda into your IBEX home directory. Okay, so the first thing that we're going to want to do is clone this repository into our home directory. So when you log into IBEX, you're automatically dumped into your home directory. Um, and we can run the uh, PWD command to see whether or not we are in fact in your user home directory. Now, so here I am in the IBEX training home directory. Your home directory will obviously have your username there. Um, and at this point, we can run uh, ls just to see the contents of your user directory. Now, your user home directory will probably have quite a lot of things there. Um, this training user uh, doesn't have really anything in its home directory. Um, so don't be bothered if you have a whole bunch of stuff in your home directory that's obviously expected. So what we're going to do now is we're going to clone this repository from GitHub into our home directory. So we can come down here, and since we're already in the home directory, we can just copy the git clone command and paste it into our terminal, and then hit enter. Okay, and now if we run ls again, we'll see that we have this new directory, ibex miniconda install. And if we change directories into that directory, we can see that we have the files um, that uh, are actually here, a license, a readme, an install, and an uninstall script. So the script that we're interested in is the, um, is the install script. So let's take a look at the contents of that uh, installation script before we run it. So the first thing we need to do is actually download the uh, Miniconda 3 installer script itself for Linux from the uh, from Anaconda. So that's this line here, this wget uh, line. Um, then we're going to run the installer script with bash, and then we're just going to delete it just to clean things up and keep tidy. Then that installer script is going to um, make some changes to your uh, bash rc uh, file in your home directory. And this is going to enable um, uh, certain conda commands to uh, work properly from shells and subshells and things like that. So we need to resource that uh, bash rc so that those modifications will be uh, will take effect in the current shell that we're in. And then lastly, we're going to run this conda update command just to make sure that we have the most recent version of conda. Now the installer will grab the most recent version of mini conda, but the conda tool itself um, sometimes has more recent versions available than the version that is packaged with the latest version of Miniconda. I know it's a bit confusing, but this last conda update command will just make sure that we have, in fact, the latest version of conda. Okay, so now that we know uh, what is in that uh, installer script, we can go ahead and run it. So we'll just do source install Miniconda. And so now we are, uh, we've downloaded the installer script and we are going through the, the steps of the installer script from Anaconda. So the first, we're gonna be asked to review the license agreement so we can hit enter. And then we can just press the space bar. So this is a standard three clause BSD license. The um, uh, Conda is an open source tool. So we can just kind of scan through here um, until we get to the end. And then we just type yes and hit enter. The next question we're going to be asked is where do we want to install Miniconda 3? And you should accept the default uh, location, which would be to install directly into your home directory at this path, um, home slash your username slash Miniconda 3. So we'll just hit enter again so that we install there. And now the Miniconda 3 distribution is being installed. 
And this shouldn't take too terribly long, at most uh, a few minutes. But it will depend to some degree on the uh, speed of the internet connection, which should be pretty good, um, and the, uh, the extent to which other people are uh, hitting the home directory servers with lots of IO. So we can see that this initial uh, base conda environment is being created. And it, the base environment is created in, again, our home IBEX mini conda 3 directory. And these are all the things that are installed as part of this base environment, which includes um, Python. Uh, where is Python? So Python should be here. Yep, so we'll have Python 3.8.3. .3, and it will also install pip. And then these other libraries are, um, are libraries that uh, Conda requires to interact with the operating system itself. So in this case, Linux. And then of course, I guess we'll have the Conda tool here, version 4.8.3. Okay, let's see if this is finished. Installed, installed. Okay, so once that base environment will be installed, you're asked if you want to initialize the um, mini conda 3 by running conda in it and i highly recommend that you just type yes and hit enter so this is going to set up your um your uh, bash profile so that uh, the conda activate command works properly and so that the base environment is automatically available whenever you log into or log out or log into ibex And now what is running is this update command. So if we look at the update command, so we can see that actually Conda 4.8.5 is the most recent version of Conda. So there've been a couple of patches since the mini Conda distribution was released. And this update command is just grabbing those patches as well as more recent versions of the other uh, OS specific packages that are required. And so we're downloading, and so now we're installing the packages for this update. And that's it, we're done. So now if you were to type uh, which conda, you could see that the conda executable is indeed found in the mini conda 3 bin directory. And then if we were to type conda dash dash version, we'll see that the conda version that we have is 4.8.5, which is as expected. Okay, um, one last thing that I wanted to cover. So the default setup with conda will be whenever you log into IBEX, by default, the, the base uh, environment will automatically be activated. Um, now I tend to like this, I tend to view it as a feature. However, um, if you don't like it, that's fine. You can configure this behavior. So in particular, um, there is a section in the readme of the GitHub repo on deactivating Conda's base environment on login. And so basically there is this command here, which will um, create a .conda rc configuration file and it will set this auto activate base to be false. And then that means whenever you log into um, to IBEX, this base environment will not automatically be activated. So if I run this command, let's and hit enter, then um, the now my conda configuration file has been changed, and we can actually uh, look at the conda rc file to see that that change has actually been reflected. So the next time I um, I log out and then log back into IBEX, then the base environment will no longer be active. But the conda, uh, the conda tool will be there and the conda activate commands and everything will work normally. It's just that by default, the base environment will not be there. Of course, um, you can run this command again if you wanted to set it back to true. And then you can see that it has been set back to true. So you kind of decide how you want to uh, configure the base environment as you see fit. Okay, so that kind of concludes this, uh, this webinar. So at this point you have seen how to 
uh, clone the GitHub repository, and then run the installer script to install uh, Miniconda distribution and the Conda tool into your home directory on IBEX. So at this point, you are ready to go with um, learning how to use Conda to manage your data science and machine learning software stacks for all the work that you're going to be doing on IBEX. I have unmuted. Thanks. So um, can you please confirm the Zoom attendees? Can you please confirm you can hear me clearly? OK. So I think there is a transition going on here. OK, my name is Mohsen Emma Sheikh. I'm really, really sorry. I should have uh, introduced myself uh, right in the beginning. I'm one of the computational scientists at KSL, and my colleague Naga uh, Raja is here. He's a fellow computational scientist in the same team. Now, uh, we're going to talk a little bit about um, job scheduling on IBEX. And for that, we need to understand what a job scheduler is. Um, simply put, it schedules uh, batch jobs on your behalf where you actually submit a workflow in the form of a job script and uh, to, a, to a scheduler. And uh, its job basically is to schedule more jobs than the resource uh, so that these jobs can actually run depending on the resource allocation that has been requested for a certain amount of time. What does it achieve? It achieves uh, quite a few things. And uh, the most prominent ones uh, that uh, you, you may actually reduce the turnaround time uh, for your job to run. So uh, you can submit a lot of jobs. You don't have to just twiddle your thumbs and wait for your job to run. Uh, you can submit multiple jobs all at the same time, go home, sleep, come back uh, next morning and all of the workflows will be done. Uh, it will allow you to automate stuff as well so that uh, you have different uh, steps in the workflow. You can automate them in, in, a, in a script and uh, the scheduler will run on your behalf. And uh, the last thing that it does is uh, from a holistic point of view, it maximizes the uh, utilization of the very precious resource that we have this HPC cluster. So what do we have? Uh, as Saber mentioned this morning, we have a uh, few uh, microarchitectures of CPUs. Yes, please. There is, there is a certain limitation of uh, number of running jobs and number of queued jobs uh, that is on our HPC website. But if you are interested in uh, CPUs and GPUs, they have different uh, uh, limits. Uh, so if you can, uh, contact us on Slack, for example, uh, we can actually uh, confirm those uh, for you. Both, yes, yeah. So um, we have uh, quite a substantial amount of CPUs uh, of different architectures. A single monolithic job cannot span on multiple architectures all, all at the same time, but you can expect multiple jobs where you want more throughput uh, of your jobs running. You can actually uh, use Intel architecture. Um, and then we have got a newly arrived AMD Epic Roam. Uh, they are 108 nodes. Each node has 128 cores in two sockets. Uh, and the associated memory footprint of each uh, node is pretty uh, decent as well in terms of uh, serving the workloads. 
these nodes are shared nodes. That means more than one users will be using uh, this node. Uh, Slum actually allocates uh, the resource that you've asked for, and it has the responsibility of encapsulating your workload so that you don't step over each other, right? So you don't have to worry anything about that sort when you are actually writing your stuff. When it comes to GPUs, we have got uh, a number of GPUs microarchitectures, but all of them are NVIDIA at the moment. Um, and there are new ones coming up as well in this list. So they'll be uh, commissioned soon. Uh, then we have got a few nodes, special nodes with very, very large memory. Uh, these are good for uh, especially database applications. Uh, and the one uh, uh, applications which actually require a lot of shared memory. Uh, to run. So uh, you can uh, leverage those two for your workflows. So we use Slurm, as I mentioned before, uh, as a resource manager or a scheduler, and it supports uh, complex scheduling algorithms. Um, so you can actually simply do a simple job script and submit, but you can actually do quite a few other things in terms of uh, exhibiting the whole workflow, multi-step workflow in a, a, job script, a job script or multiple job scripts. Uh, it gives you a way to describe and uh, submit uh, your work to the uh, scheduler. It uh, gives you a way of scribing, uh, prescribing the workload that you're trying to run uh, in, in terms of the resources that you want, like CPUs, GPUs, how much memory per CPU you require, or total memory that you require that uh, all the CPUs will be using. And if there are any constraints, which means to say, any features you are after, you, you, you really want to run on Intel or AMD or a certain type of GPU, right? Because it has some added technology in it or your code requires it. It also gives you a means of monitoring your job status. So basically uh, a job in flight or pending is one state, but also once the job has finished, you can actually query on that job and some of the matrix will be there uh, for you to actually look at. For example, the elapsed time is one of them, or the job, depending on the job IDs, you can actually have a look of what was the job name, how many CPUs I asked for it and so on and so forth. So that's a good rec record keeping and that's called accounting. It has a charging system. We don't charge it right now. Uh, we don't, don't charge IBEX right now. There's no project allocation, but it is imminent, it is coming. So you need to be aware of that. Moving on to uh, querying the system, uh, I'll be showing a few demos right at the end, but uh, S info is your friend. It actually shows you the whole status of the system, uh, what is available in total and in what states, whether it is allocated, whether it is idle or it is available to run or not, which means some of the nodes may be drained, some of the nodes may be in maintenance state, so they are not available for the users, right? And uh, S info can be a, a dirty output so it is a lot uh, because it has got all sorts of architectures there all sorts of gpus and cpus and so on and so forth you can filter on it if you want to but we have another uh, in-house tool called g info which actually tells you a little bit of uh, uh, gpus what kind of gpus and what states are they available so here is a small list of that again there'll be a demo on that Another useful command of Slurm is uh, SQ. SQ actually shows the queue. Uh, what is the status of the queue uh, and, and, and how many jobs are there? Uh, who has submitted these jobs? Sometimes you're interested, sometimes you're not interested. But uh, one of the things that it shows is, why is my job waiting so long? You can actually have a look at the queue, look at these start times and uh, look at the status of some jobs and the associated resource uh, with that as well. So some of the jobs will be single node jobs. Most of them will be single node jobs are in running state, R state, but some of them might actually be uh, running on multiple nodes, one job running on let's say multiple nodes. So your turn will come but when that job finishes, because it has asked for it, it was prioritized because of its age and, uh, and everyone goes through the same journey. You can filter this command uh, by minus U, that means minus U means username. Uh, so it will only show your jobs. You can um, uh, look at the certain partition, like there are two partitions, one is batch, the other one is debug, uh, what jobs are there. 
And you can actually look at the job, a specific job and its state by minus J. These are a few handy uh, filters to use. How do you specify resources? Well, the resources are in a resource pool um, and uh, they are looked from, from a scheduler point of view, they are looked at as uh, uh, these pools are called partitions, right? So there is a one monolithic partition at the moment on IBEX, it's called batch. There is a very, very small partition called debug, which is uh, for short time, if you want something to be checked on a very small scale, like two or four cores, you can readily get that bit and uh, prototype something and make it ready for the production stuff and then submit the job to batch, right? Um, there is another um, uh, very important one um, attribute uh, uh, while talking to Slurm, uh, uh, or conversating with Slurm is constraints. If you don't care wh where your job, what microarchitecture your job should run, uh, you don't have to use it, right? But if you're really interested in running on Intel or AMD or uh, GPUs, depending on your software, basically your application, because it requires that, then uh, the constraints are very useful. So in order to have a look at what constraints are there, you can actually query S info and this command uh, with these uh, filters, minus N, capital N E, and then minus O, show me these three fields. And it will show you for every node, there are constraints associated. So if you can actually put this keyword in your job script as constraint, minus minus constraint, it will go to that node, one of those nodes actually, whichever is available. So the allocatable resources uh, that we have are CPUs, GPUs. You can ask for memory and you can ask for wall time, which means how long, for how long these uh, three things that you would really want to ask for. So uh, you can run jobs in two modes. One is the batch mode, fire and forget. Basically you submit something, go home, come back tomorrow morning, everything hopefully will be done. Uh, again, if it doesn't, wait for the next morning. There's another thing. Basically, sometimes you want to prototype, right, on a very small scale, like, for example, in the debug queue. You want interactivity. You want to run every command on the command prompt to see whether it is doing what it's supposed to do, right, or whether I'm doing something wrong before actually putting it into a, a script. You can use interactive sessions for that, and uh, uh, Slurm allows that to so you can allocate a resource with similar kind of resource allocation uh, uh, resource allocation request. And when it is granted to you, you can use it in an interactive way. So moving on, here is an example of a job script. And it is a simple job script, which actually uh, asks for one GPU minus minus grass equals GPU one. I don't care, uh, well, I do care with minus minus constraint equals, I need V hundred, Volta hundred, NVIDIA Volta hundred. And uh, basically I want it for one hour, right? And I want to call this job my first job, right? So this is the, this is the directive for Slurm in terms of manifesting what sort of resource are you asking for? Right. Then on, once that is finished, and you can see it is preceded by hash s batch. So this is talking to Slurm. Only Slurm will be able to understand this. For anything else, it is a comment because it starts with hash. Right. Now the next two lines are the module load and the s run line. They are like a command. Right. So what is it doing? If you were on a command prompt, you would first load the environment. Right, so module load CUDA, for example. And then you will try and run the executable. Hello world is an executable here. I'm trying to run it. I'm actually preceding, uh, prepending it with S run. This is a launcher, okay? So this is a slam launcher, which will actually launch the job onto the nodes themselves. Where does it uh, actually make a huge difference to use S run or not use S run? If you were on the single node, right? Uh, in, 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 and, and you have this one GPU, dot slash hello world will run on that GPU. That's not a problem, okay? 
But if you are running on multiple nodes, this job is supposed to use multiple nodes, for example, srun is your friend, okay? So this will be an MPI application, which will be running on multiple cores, more than one core or more than one node, right? So because they are different machines, but they are being used for the same job and your software is written in a way that it can make use of that, srun will be the launcher for that and then your command, uh, command, uh, application and then the arguments for that application if they're running. So this is a job script. You will save this job script as a file and you will give it a file name. I called it jobscript.slurm, right? So up until now, Slurm does not know anything about this because I haven't submitted a job. In order to submit a job, I'm doing something called sbatch. sbatch is a command which takes a file and submits it to the Slurm scheduler. It will read this file, especially the hash aspatch uh, part and will schedule your job, right? Once the allocation is granted for that job, what was scheduled, then it will run these lines, module load, CUDA and srun on the resource that has been allocated. Does it make sense, right? So sbatch, as I mentioned, does exactly that. So say, for example, you submitted a job, it's sitting in the queue, it's pending, but you now think, well, I did a mistake in there. I want to cancel this job. S cancel is the command for canceling that particular job. So first off, I'm doing SQ minus U, show me the jobs that I have submitted. Uh, by the username. So I'm filtering it by the username. And I'm taking this job ID 137 blah, blah, and actually running um, S cancel on it, right? So S cancel that job ID. Now you can see that job ID is gone, okay? Without running. Right, so before I mentioned uh, two modes, uh, I was talking about a batch mode and then an interactive mode. The previous one was a batch mode. You, uh, you, you wrote your uh, job script, you submitted the job script and Slurm is running those commands on your behalf, right? In a different mode where you want to debug stuff or prototype stuff, or maybe it is a requirement of your uh, application to run it interactively, you can ask for uh, some resource like I'm asking here with a command called salloc, right? So salloc uh, or salloc, uh, runs on your prompt with some uh, attributes, which are requests, what kind of resource you want. Slurm will take it as a resource request and will try and schedule this. If you are asking for exuberant uh, amount of request, you may wait for a long time, right? But since I have a very modest request here, one GPU for 10 minutes, right? And I want it in the debug queue. Right, so this allocates me quite swiftly or uh, promptly. When this is granted, I can load my environment and then use srun to actually launch my application there. Make sense? You can achieve the same behavior by uh, uh, directly running srun on this prompt uh, and uh, that will, provide you an allocation first and then run your application. There's a demo on that uh, as well, right at the end. And once you are finished, you uh, type exit and that will bring you out of that session, back to the prompt. So as I mentioned, uh, the uh, value of SRUN, uh, especially when you have like, for example, uh, an OpenMP multi-threaded application, which uh, makes use of more than one cores on the same node, the application is uh, uh, capable of it. If, if the application is capable of it, you can actually ask for multiple cores and then use srun to launch an application with those number of cores. In this situation, I'm using 10 cores with uh, OpenMP threading. Coming to monitoring, as I mentioned, SQ is a uh, command to actually look at the status of your job that you have submitted, whether it is pending or running or uh, failed, for example. So it will not be uh, in the in the in the list. 
You can um, filter it by user or by job ID. S control is another very useful command, uh, which has a uh, sub commands uh, in front of it because it's a it's it's a suite of uh, uh, utilities. The most relevant one uh, from a job script uh, job job point of view is S control show job the job ID. You can see it actually gives quite a lot of output and it is uh, deliberate because it gives you how the job was allocated right is allocated uh, i say is because once the job is finished you won't be able to query s control so sometimes our users actually put this inside the job script just to capture what was um, uh, what was allocated and what shape and form so that when things go wrong they can communicate with us the support team through these attributes saying this was the output of s control and this failed right so now we are more informed of what the job was looking at and how it was requested so you can see quite a few things including uh, the memory for example i asked for 115 gig of memory and uh, number of cpus were 16 so on and so forth once the job has finished some of its attributes go in database, right? So you can query this job even after the lifetime of the job, right? How it was finished, that is, in what state did it exit? Uh, did it complete? Did it fail? Uh, what kind of uh, um, elapsed time did it have? How many CPUs I asked for? Was there a GPU in there or not? How much memory I, uh, it used, for example, and so on and so forth. Um, it can also be uh, queried by uh, or filtered by minus u minus j um, attributes. Moving on, here are some other uh, examples of job script. This is an open MP uh, job script, which is a multi-threaded application, as I mentioned before. It is capable of using multiple cores on the same node, right? On the same machine as if you were running on a multi-core laptop. Uh, in this situation, we are using four OpenMP threads. And to manifest that, uh, we need uh, four CPUs. So what we are asking is minus minus n tasks. This is one task, one job equals one. And within this, uh, this job, I need four cores to be used, right? So minus minus CPUs per task is set to four, right? And this CPUs per task will be leveraged by the environment variable OMP num threads because it's an open MP uh, code and uh, it, it understands open MP. And this is an open MP relevant environment variable. You set that and then you launch your application with S run. This is an MPI job. As I was mentioning before, you can actually have MPI to run a single node or a multi node job if your application is capable of it, right? So here, I'm asking for not one, but 32 tasks, right? Because what I'm saying is run the whole application as if there were 32 machines it was running on. One single application running on 32 machines. Uh, at the risk of overcomplicating it, the paradigm is called single program, multiple data. Right? So this kind of application will run on uh, IBEX using minus minus n tasks equal 32. And if you wanted all of them on one node, for example, you can even tell that to Slurm by saying minus minus n tasks per node equals 32 or tasks per node equals 32. On top of it, if you really want to be specific that my application was compiled with Intel compiler, right? So I want it on Intel architecture. So you can actually do minus minus constraint equals Intel and any available resource for that amount of, uh, with that amount of course will be allocated to your job, right? And I want it for 10 minutes. Then I load my environment with modules and then I launch my application with S run minus N 32 because I asked for it, hello world MPI. For large memory nodes, uh, what you need to add in your Slurm requisition is hash s batch minus minus mem equals the, the amount of memory you require. Um, uh, this memory, if it is 
asked for more than 376 G or gig will automatically go to these large memory nodes, right? So basically the message is it will go there, but ask whatever you want rather than whatever you can get. By default, this has a value. This minus minus mem has a value. If you don't put it in there, it is two gigabytes per core. So let's say if you ask for one CPU, you get two gigabytes, right? If you ask for four CPU, you get eight gigabytes. But if your, mem if your application fails because there was not sufficient memory, you can actually ask for minus minus mem equal, let's say more than that. And uh, that will be given to those number of CPUs, right? So I asked for four CPUs, but I want, let's say 50 gigabytes of memory because my application is memory intensive. So uh, uh, I'll say minus minus mem equals for, uh, 50 minus minus CPUs uh, per task equals four. Make sense? This is a GPU job again. Um, before I uh, mentioned uh, minus minus grez equals GPU colon one was the way to ask for a GPU. There is a convenient way to ask for a GPU on IBEX as well. It's minus minus GPUs, okay? Irrespective of what type of GPU you want, you can put minus minus GPUs equals one. But if you really want a type of GPU, you can add a constraint there, minus minus constraint, constraint equals the type. The type here is V100. And on top of it, if I want more memory than what is given to me uh, by default, that is two gigabytes, I can ask for that too. Now, one thing that uh, while we are talking about these GPU jobs, GPU jobs are best submitted from G login node, okay? So remember there were two login nodes. They have been talked about in previous uh, presentations as I login and G login. G stands for GPU, okay? I stands for uh, Intel, but it also accepts job for AMD, right? So if you have pure CPU jobs running, try submitting from I login node. And if you have GPU jobs running, uh, the environment is a bit different. So you actually log into SSH into G login and then submit from there. So here I'm asking for four GPUs and I want all four GPUs on the same node. That is minus minus GPUs per node equals four as well, right? But if I wanted them on four different nodes, I could easily do minus minus GPUs per node equals one, which means to say every node should have one GPU, right? Very, very good question. So it's a busy resource, especially during the conference time, right? When uh, data science users are submitting whole lot of uh, publications to these conferences. So, and, and they, these jobs run at different times. They finish at different times. So you may actually find uh, that the scheduler has free resources, right, in G-Info, uh, but your job isn't running. And if your job is capable of communicating over multiple GPUs uh, on multiple nodes, what you can do is you can ask for multiple GPUs on multiple nodes for still, but on multiple nodes. So you can get fit into this fragmented availability, right? Does it make sense? So the turnaround time might actually be better. But uh, in, in a lot of scenarios, uh, some of the applications do not uh, communicate on different nodes. You need that co-located on the same node. So if that is the case, then this will be the way to do it. Okay? Right, so uh, common constraints that you can put um, um, or features that you can ask for is Intel. If you want Skylake, uh, Intel Skylake, you can actually put Skylake there or Cascade Lake, which has more cores than Skylake and are a bit faster than Skylake. You can ask for that. You can ask for AMD uh, CPUs. If you are uh, running on them, uh, it has 128 cores. Um, uh, and uh, Rome is another way of asking AMD nodes, actually. On GPUs, you can ask for, let's say, V100 
P100. Um, the new ones that are coming in are called A100, so they will be available when, whenever. Uh, so you can uh, ask for those nodes with uh, constraints equals 800. And then there are a few uh, graphics cards as well, GTX and RTX 10. Yes, please. Both. So essentially, um, the question is about the difference of architecture. Does it apply only to the architecture or does it have any bearing about the compiler with which it was compiled? AMD has been really clever in allowing Intel compiled binaries to run on AMD architecture, right? But if you have compiled something with AMD compiler, that may not run on Intel, right? So uh, concisely put, Intel binaries are compatible to run on AMD. So you may not have to change um, the binary, but in some cases, the behavior might be a bit different, right? Especially where Intel MKL is being used. If you see something like that, ping us, we'll help you out. If, you, if it is a dynamic binary, it is, if it is a dynamically compiled binary, there are two ways of compiling binary, static and dynamic. If it is a dynamically compiled binary, you can run something called LDD on it as a command and then the binary name, and it will give you all the list of libraries it requires when running in runtime. And there are some very, very easy to uh, identify ones that they are Intel basically. Right, so you can tell yeah, this was compiled with Intel. Exactly, yes. Uh, we, we are not actually uh, using AMD compiler as yet, uh, as far as I know. Yeah, but the two popular ones that we use is Intel and GCC. Okay, so both are binary compatible. You can move around uh, in uh, both the architectures. Okay, for large memory, for example, you're asking for minus minus mem equals two terabytes, and that will go directly to the large memory nodes. For local storage, if you want local SSD disks on uh, some of the nodes that are there uh, to do some very, very high IOPS, IO operation work, uh, like for example, uh, uh, reading from a reference uh, in, in bioinformatics is one. In data science, there are images that you can put and that can give you better IO throughput. So IO bound uh, workloads might actually benefit from it. Not all, the, um, not all the nodes have equal amount of SSDs or SSDs at all, right? SSD is a technology, local disk basically, local disk as if you are uh, saving stuff on your same laptop, right? So the way to ask for it is local underscore the size. So, so look at that um, S info output of features. And there are a couple of features there uh, with different sizes. So you can ask for that and it can uh, give you that node which has that much local disk available. All right? the allocation will be on those nodes. Okay, so two uh, important um, announcements here. Um, there is a new file system we are prototyping with. And uh, for those who are interested in running on V100 nodes, uh, even though there were uh, more cores available uh, before, there'll be lesser number available now. Right, so uh, there are two types of V100 nodes we have. One has four V100 GPUs on it. The other one has eight GPUs on it. The one with four GPUs, uh, four of the cores have been taken away from by, by the system uh, for file system, um, uh, for file system work. And uh, the available CPUs have been downsized to 28. On the eight GPUs per node nodes, we have a 56 GPUs, uh, 56 CPUs available. Okay, before they were uh, uh, more. Sorry, it's not 56. I'll correct it. It's uh, uh, 40 GPUs available. Right, uh, 40 CPUs available. 
That means for each GPUs, you can maximum ask for five CPUs per GPU at the moment. And the memory has been downsized to 712 gigabytes as well. Before it was 750. Okay, there are uh, ways to actually answer such questions like, why is my job not running? So you can query uh, the um, time limit, for example, and uh, uh, the reasons uh, for, for why your job isn't running. So one of the examples here shows resources because resources aren't there for your job that you have asked for. And that also means you can actually say, but I only asked for four cores, but you asked for three days. So look at the time limit that you have asked for. Three means three days minus zero, zero, zero. That means in 24 hours, if, uh, in, in sets of 24 hours, you have actually asked for 72 hours worth of time. And the resources cannot be scheduled because there are other jobs that are being fit uh, in those uh, nooks and crannies, which are uh, requiring smaller resource for a smaller amount of time. Right. So if you can use it for a smaller uh, resource for a smaller amount of time, it is easier to navigate through the scheduler. Um, if you do a manual uh, SQ or man SQ, it can actually show you quite a lot of reasons. And some of the common reasons that you might actually see Okay, I don't have that here, but if you do a man SQ and go to the uh, manual page, um, there is a whole section on the reasons and the explanation of what they mean. So if that reason occurs or uh, is, is shown on this SQ uh, output, uh, you can have a look at that and try and understand it if it is um, obvious. If it is not obvious, just ping us and we can help you out with uh, uh, finding out why your job isn't running and for what reasons. So moving on um, with some um, demos now. So the first one um, is batch uh, submission. And here, what we are doing is uh, we're checking first the resource availability using S batch. Oh, sorry, S info, and you can see that it is showing quite a few things. It is showing uh, the partition. It is showing the limit on the partition, uh, the maximum number of hours you can have the resource in this partition, and it is actually showing the node names uh, that this partition has. Um, okay, so it is quite verbose, but You can have a look at a concise uh, list of um, GPUs, for example, using G info, uh, its availability, how, are, how many of them are being used, how many of them are free. If a lot of are uh, free, you can ask for more GPUs e either for one job or you can submit multiple jobs with multiple GPUs and expect them to run. If it is really busy, uh, have expectation management that you might be waiting or your jobs might be waiting, right? So uh, the next one is um, uh, you can query the list of jobs that have been scheduled. Um, there are a lot of them. And then you can see uh, there are fields, uh, relevant fields, the job ID is there, the partition is there. Uh, you can see the node list, um, the job have been uh, run, are, are running on. And uh, you can see the amount of resource, the CPUs allocated, for example, and uh, for how long has it been running? Okay, but you can uh, make it a little bit easier on the eye by filtering it for yourself, for, uh, for, for, for your own jobs uh, by this uh, filter called a minus u and the username and it only shows the 
job that you have or this user has. Okay. So next up is uh, features and constraints. So as I mentioned before, you can query what features and constraints each node has. Uh, again, there are quite a lot of features. Uh, so some of them, uh, as you can see, uh, local storage uh, is one with uh, some amount of size. Uh, Intel is the other, Skylake is the other. So you can uh, put these constraints in your job script to ask for such a node, which has these constraints. Okay. All right, so moving on to interactive jobs, how you ask for interactivity. So basically this is a job script. Um, and as I mentioned, you have it is going to run on your behalf by the scheduler. Uh, but, uh, okay, so this first uh, shows you how to submit that using sbatch. Remember this is batch mode. There is a job script that is being submitted and you can actually look at the status of the job uh, CG means it's going to be starting soon uh, on this node, right? Moving on. So one thing that I might have missed is if I look at the job script itself, I was asking for the standard out to go in this file with this file name and standard out to go in this file name. So that if there are any errors, they're in a separate file and the regular usual output is in this file. And when the job actually starts to run on your behalf by a scheduler, when this node is available, you'll see that these two files will appear in your current working directory where you submit it from, okay? Right, and you can have a look at these files. This is the output, uh, arbitrary output here. Writing, I think that's that. That was about submitting the jobs. And this is about the interactive jobs. So uh, if, you, if you want to uh, do some prototyping, uh, quick, um, uh, quick sanity check on something, there are two ways of asking for the resource that is interactive. One is directly uh, putting everything that you require on SRUN and what will SRUN do? SRUN can actually go and ask for that resource. Once that resource has been allocated, you see the uh, node name has changed here. That means you have landed directly on that node that has been allocated to you, okay? With the resource that you have asked for. So here you have asked for, here you have asked for four cores that are supposed to run as separate tasks for that job. And this job is an MPI job in this case. And I've asked for this for one hour, right? But I've also asked for this to go directly to the node. So I want to land directly onto the node. For that, I am actually doing an interactive bash session on that node with this uh, argument called minus minus PTY. Okay, so, and the uh, manifestation of that is, you see the machine name was different before and after the job was allocated, the machine name actually changed. That means the address where you are now has changed. And the machine name is nothing else but the IP address of the device that you are on. So you can check the host name and then that confirms that you are actually on the node that you have alloc been allocated. In order to exit, yeah, in order to exit, you just write exit, type exit, enter, and then you can actually get out of that interactive session, right? And control D does the same thing. Okay, and now you're back on the login node. So remember login node are shared resource. Everyone uses login node. So do not run anything that is compute or memory intensive on that. SLOC is another command 
that is doing pretty much the same thing, but it keeps you on the login node so that you can uh, launch stuff from the login node onto the resource that has been allocated to you. So here uh, I'm asking for two nodes. And this is very useful example because SLOC makes complete sense now because in SRUN, you landed on the node. What if you require two nodes, right? What if your application is supposed to run on two nodes? Then it makes really confusing that you're on a head node, you can't see the other node and so on and so forth. So in this situation, you need two nodes, you ask for it through SLOC, I need two nodes. Uh, minus minus nodes equal to two with that much amount of time. And this grants you that allocation, but you will see that your machine name will not change. Even though they have been allocated, right? Your machine name hasn't changed. So if you ran SQ, you will see that there is a job running called interactive job with these uh, uh, nodes. And now you can use S run to actually run on these nodes. So uh, my colleague is running a host name command there and it actually outputs that. Uh, that yes, you have these nodes available that where your application can run if you launch it with S run. It is, it is, you are working with the, through the scheduler. Yeah, you are still working with the scheduler. Whatever starts with S is the command to the scheduler. Right. So in order to get out of that allocation, even though you are on login node, if you uh, type exit and press enter, it will say it is relinquishing the job uh, and the resources that were allocated to the job. Okay. And lastly, let's go to monitoring. So you can monitor your jobs, as I mentioned before, uh, by SQ, for example, for their status. And uh, it shows what status it is in and where it is running. You can uh, uh, show the parameters of the request using S control uh, with a job ID. Right, so as I mentioned before, it, it's a bit verbose, but it gives you that information that you require, especially the number of your nodes, uh, number of cores you've asked for, the memory and what time have you asked for it. You, after the job has finished or even in the job uh, in flight, you can actually run uh, SECT and uh, my colleague is running uh, using a filter on her username. So she will see all the, um, all the uh, job IDs that are associated to her job and the, um, her username and the status of those jobs. Some of them are completed, some of them were canceled, some of them might have failed as well if they were, and some of them are running. And each of these job IDs have these suffixes and these are called job steps. So if this is a multi-step thing, there'll be many job steps, dot zero, dot one, dot two, dot three, right? To cancel the job that is running or is queued, uh, you can actually uh, use the command called S cancel. So here my colleague is going to capture the job ID and try to cancel this job. Here we go. And the job should disappear from scheduler. Awesome. So this was a um, short intro uh, as a demo to all the stuff that we have spoken about. Any questions before we move on to the application side? Okay. Um, I hope the uh, Zoom uh, folks are still with us. So without further ado, I'll hand over to uh, my colleague Naga, who is going to talk about some application examples.
very good afternoon to all myself nagarajan in short naga that is actually better uh, so uh, here in coast and coast core app i'm actually supporting uh, most of bioinformatics applications uh, so i'm actually specialized in computer science still uh, i'm actually like uh, deep dive into computer science and followed by uh, most of bioinformatics workloads in and around of uh, coast and collaboration and so on uh, so here uh, in the last presentation, uh, Mohsen actually explained about uh, a various job statistics, how we can actually schedule a job, how we can monitor the job and so on. Here I'll be taking uh, some examples related with bioinformatics, how we are going to um, like uh, run the job from end to end. Uh, so here in bioinformatics, uh, one of the common application is uh, fast QC. The fast QC is quality control uh, um, on uh, the prepared sample. So, for example, in the previous presentation, Sabar actually explained about uh, most of the IBEX architecture actually connected with the sequencing mission and the cryo EM mission and so on, various instruments, right? So, for example, as soon as once the data is prepared from Illumina sequencer or cryo EM or whatever the infrastructure, the data is actually dumped into IBEX architecture. Right, then we need to verify the quality of the file, whether it is like usable or where the problem is actually coming from before processing your data set. So the fast QC actually help us to understand whether the quality control or uh, the expected results are available from the raw data, right? So this case, I'm actually using a fast QC is the software. Uh, then, oh, sorry, fast QC is, uh, First, you see is uh, the software. Here, I'll be actually using the input file. Either it may be present from FASTA format or the SAM format or a BAM format. So this application actually accepts three different parameters, FASTQ, SAM, or BAM. The expected output will be a FASTQC file, right? Uh, here, uh, in order to actually process the data set, uh, like, no, uh, I may need to actually understand for first the software is available on the infrastructure or not. Right. So using uh, the software, first I need to actually search the module. Then once the module is actually available on the IPEX, I'm going to actually add on into my uh, infrastructure or on my environment. Then I'm going to actually allocate what resources I'm actually required to run the software. Then finally, I'm going to run the status of the job and finally going to validate. Right. So for example, these are the different steps I need to follow. First, I'll be actually searching module available fast QC. Fast QC is the software, whether it is available or not. Once it is actually available, I will be loading into the software module. Module load a specific version, right? But then you need to actually understand the application parameter. Say, for example, whether the application is actually multi-node parameter or a multi-threaded parameter, or it can be scalable across the node or within the node, those parameters we need to actually understand. Say, for example, here, dash T threats at, yeah. Uh, dash T, the threats actually specifies to improve the speed up of the application. Say, for example, by default, the fast QC application uses a single thread or by default number of thread based on the application development, right? Say, for example, in my case, uh, here, as you can see, this is the example script. The example script is actually available on uh, the directory, IBEX, uh, IBEX Scratch Projects, IBEX ESTEM, IBEX 101. This is the example script I prepared uh, for your experiment, right? Here, the first parameter, uh, this application is actually used to run on a single node with multi-threading environment, meaning is I need to actually allocate only one node to run my job. Then second day CPU per task, I'm actually assigned 16. This 16 number of thread, uh, 16 CPUs should match with this number of thread. So that now you can actually improve the performance during the running time. So for example, here I'm specifying CPU per task 24, the same 24 supposed to match with the application parameter, threads 24 or 16, how much, whatever you are actually allocating. Uh, then partition batch, the partition batch is by default because uh, as Mohsen mentioned before, we have two partitions I IBEX. One is batch partition, that is the production environment. Uh, say for example, more number of node and more number of resources available on the batch partition. 
The other partition is like debug. Debug is very short duration of the job. Say, for example, my application is not properly learning. I need to debug or I need to get in the node very quickly for my debugging. The other partition is a debug. So in a production cycle, we need to actually use batch as a default partition, right? I need to, then I need to specify the name of the job, quality control or whatever, the standard output file, standard error file, uh, how long I'm actually looking for the resources, maybe one hour or two hour, uh, those parameters you need to specify and memory requirement. Uh, here, uh, for your answer session, um, uh, we are actually created a reservation called IBEX 101 underscore 2021. This reservation actually gives you um, a, uh, immediate resources for your testing purpose, right? Uh, in case if the reservation, um, the reservation actually gives you um, uh, the flexibility to allocate the resources as soon as possible for your testing. Then I am loading the application. I am running the parameter. Once I am submitted the job, you can actually see the job number. Uh, those explanation already um, given by Mohsen. The same parameter. Once the quality control files are actually started, you can see here uh, the output files. So, for example, the percentage of uh, the quality checked like 5%, 10% over the time frame. Once the quality control is actually completed, we can actually see the results by Google Chrome. Say for example, Google Chrome followed by the HTML file. This HTML file actually provides a complete QC report. Say for example, these reads are not actually good. Say for example, we need to actually trim the read to proceed on the next level because of you can actually see uh, the reads are actually distributed uh, from uh, different uh, pass, <clears throat> right? So like that, we need to actually like understand the application parameter and need to uh, include the application module and try to run the job. Either it may be a single threaded or multi-threaded based on the application characterizations. Very clear or any doubt? Most of the bioinformatics applications are mainly multi-threaded as motion, uh, mentioned earlier. It is not actually a multi-node application. Most of like more than 99 percentage of applications are a single node application in terms of biology. We may not actually look for multi-nodes. Say for example, if we have a multiple samples, we will be actually running different samples on multiple nodes, right? Not multiple nodes in a single sample. We will be distributing a data parallelization. Say for example, in my case, I'm having 100 um, uh, fast queue uh, samples I need to process. Uh, I need to actually like validate 100 fast QC files. I'll be running 100 jobs as an job array or 100 jobs across different nodes. Every node will take care of one fast QC in a parallel way. Any doubt or any clarification as of now? So here I will be actually explaining about uh, some of the IBEX policies uh, and job extensions. So for example, uh, here, as you can see, uh, the login node is mainly used for uh, preparation purpose. Either you may be actually using for uh, preparing a job script or editing your script, submitting your job and so on. So please don't run any of your jobs on the login node. The main reason is actually because um, this login node is actually shared by all the users, say for example, even IBEX users, uh, like even 100 or 1000 users, they will be sharing the same login node. If you are running the job on the login node, um, like no others may not possible to log in um, because of you may be running huge computational or you may be using most of the memories on the login node, right? So the login node is mainly used for only uh, submitting your jobs and not for like running your dedicated jobs. Then uh, here, uh, the time parameter is the only one we need to specify um, in Slurm. Other parameters are actually default. Say for example, the partition batch and memory requirement and CPU requirement and all uh, uh, defined by default. So you need to specify time is the important parameter during your job scheduling. Uh, so the time parameter actually accept a day, 
dash hours colon minutes colon second is the format you need to follow so for example uh, here this example one day 10 hours 30 minutes duration i specified on the second job if i specify 3 colon 0 0 3 minutes i am actually allocating the resources so time is one of the important parameter to schedule your jobs uh, say for example uh, the time is actually gives you estimated time to execute say for example uh, my job i'm actually estimate, i'm estimating 10 hours to run my job assume that 10 hours is not sufficient we have a dedicated slack channel called extension in case by say for example after 9 hours the job is not completed please contact via this slack channel extension one of our system admin will extend additional 10 hours right so for example my estimated time is 10 hours within 10 hours my job is not completed what i should do because i should not interested to start from the beginning on the time zero right in in order to actually avoid repetition or um, like avoid this kind of failure please contact this slack channel one of our system admin will extend your job for additional 10 hours or whatever you specify yeah yeah please uh, so it, it so it's a good question uh, <laughs> because uh, mostly out of office hours they may not uh, work so it would be great if we can actually like extend uh, between eight to five so until five will be available it's guaranteed but if you actually ask me 10 o'clock <laughs> i'm actually down <laughs> 10 p.m not a.m <laughs> uh, the extension i can ask this any time after i finish like the, the job is finished and we didn't didn't finish it because of the time limit yes and after a week i ask you for extension for the same job is it okay uh, so basically uh, that is not actually possible say for example uh, the extension supposed to be done uh, before end of um the completion say for example uh, my expected job to run is 10 hours i specified what time 10 hours on the ninth hour i will validate the progress of the job say for example only 80 percent done so assume that one one hour is not actually possible so before end of the job completion please actually ask the slack channel i need additional hours to extend either it may be five hours or either it may be 10 hours whatever so you actually specify 10 hours in your wall clock time so you will be granted additional 10 hours though it is uh, though the job is actually record for two hours so it will be extended 100 percentage of your time uh, as per the wall clock time say for example you may even you may be actually record for one hours or two hours but system admin will provide additional the same duration so 20 hours will be granted even though the job is completed within additional uh, two hours or whatever so even though they have, they were actually extended for 20 hours within two hours the job is finished and the resource will be released from the queue any other doubt so this is actually an important parameter so um, please um, monitor your job before end of the execution and contact us for the extension because most of us even i used to actually like contact the system team for extending the job because my estimate may be wrong or maybe i'm running a first time the samples i may be like estimating four hours three hours i can see only three percent progress right then i need to actually contact for the extension um, like no that is the only option because we are actually using the ibex mainly for a shared resources right so Uh, yes yeah you can yeah yeah you can actually ask yeah so um, other than that uh, here uh, the architecture selection uh, most of the stuff actually uh, wasn't explained earlier uh, here uh, maximum 200 jobs actually reduced to 1024 jobs per user say for example uh, 1024 jobs is the maximum uh, limit per user Say, for example, IBEX is actually free. System team will actually increase to 2000 or 4000. By default, as of today, 1024 jobs can be run at a time, single CPU job. If you are running 1024 as a MPA or multi node job, as a one, one node, that is also uh, not one node, one job, that is also possible. Then, by default, maximum wall clock time is 14 days. 
other than 14 days, you may not possible to schedule in IBEX queue. Say for example, one of the sequencing job supposed to be run for one month. You may not actually allocate one month duration. Maximum you can actually allocate 14 days. If 14 days is not possible, please contact us 13th day. Is it possible to extend for additional 14 days? But this case is very tricky because even if your job is actually running for a month and month, uh, the possibility of failure is more. The reason is because we don't know uh, the failure may be coming from software or hardware or interconnect. We don't know. It's better to actually optimize. Uh, in the case, uh, maybe we can actually schedule for one-on-one -on -one meeting to customize your application or optimize your application to reduce the execution time. Right. Uh, then uh, this examples Mohsen already uh, discussed, uh, the memory allocation. So the memory allocation is also uh, additional important parameter. Say for example, memory dash dash mem gives 100 GB. Other option is we can actually use memory per CPU. Memory per CPU meaning is say for example, if you are actually allocating CPUs per task eight, eight times of eight GB will be allocated. So just ensure that which parameter you are using resource parameter memory you are using or memory per CPU you are using. Just ensure in your script which parameter it actually used. Only memory or memory per CPU. Accordingly, memory will be allocated. Then uh, the storage quota. Storage quota is actually very important. Say, for example, by default, home directory, every user actually has the home directory. It has 200 uh, GB. This 200 GB is completely backed up. Say for example, assume that yesterday I'm deleted some of the data from my home directory. What will happen? Say for example, I'm deleted, like I went home. Then after that next day, if I'm actually visiting, uh, unfortunately I'm deleted some data from home directory. Then right, you need to actually write to our system team in my directory, I'm deleted. Unfortunately, I'm deleted some of the file it's possible to roll back or recover only from home directory, not from other directories, right? So home directory, you can actually store your critical data. Say for example, some of the job script or some of the valuable information. Say for example, one of the file I'm actually needed. Say for example, license file. Assume that some of the license software, if you're using the license file supposed to be stored in your home directory, your own license file, right? Or your own script file. Those files is actually critical. Whatever the files are critical, it's better to store in home directory. By default, 200 GB is the maximum allocation. Then the next file system is Scratch. The Scratch file system is IBEX Scratch, your user ID. By default, every user owns 1.5 terabyte of storage. This storage is default for every user. The third file system is Project. Say for example, 1.5 TB is not sufficient. Uh, especially if you are running on machine learning or bioinformatics application, because the volume of data or sequence data itself very big. Say for example, one of the FASTQ file itself more than one, uh, more than 100 GB. If you are processing, it may be in multiples of two times or three times. Even if you are actually going with 100 sample, 1.5 TB is not sufficient. So in case if you are going to use in a project purpose, uh, your PA need to actually approve your required storage. Say for example, it may be 5 TB or 10 TB or 50 TB and so on. Based on your requirement, please ask your PA. Once PA approved, then will be included into the project storage. It has a more storage capacity. Then fourth one is actually very critical. It is encrypted, meaning is it's encrypted data. Say for example, even uh, if you are moving the disk from data center to anywhere, that data is not possible to recover by anonymous person. The thing is, say for example, most of uh, human genomics project, it's actually very critical. So for example, even Saudi genome project or like some of the project, um, most of them, they are actually running from a CBRC uh, a team by Professor Robert. Uh, these are all actually a confidential and encrypted data set. Those data set will be stored in encrypted. It's a highly confidential data set will be stored in encrypted uh, storage directory. So these four different file systems available in IBEX for day-by-day -day data processing. Any doubt or clarification? Encrypted? The slash home dollar user, your user ID. Yeah. 
yes uh, ibex ibex at hpc.cows.edu.sc uh, like it's a common ticket id they will actually like um, like say for example file file system is not our control application team control one of the system team will have a look and help you out on that aspects any doubt then uh, this is another important parameter say for example uh, as i said earlier we need to actually define the parameter what is i am required say for example i am actually going for a buffet i need to actually pick up what i want rather than what is actually available right so similarly say for example i am actually like requesting 10 seconds if you are requesting 10 seconds the allocation will be much faster the reason is actually because you are looking for a small portion of the resources thereby resource allocation is much faster on other way around i am actually looking for 14 days of all clock time the 14 days of all clock time is relatively big so you may not possible to the system may not provide a immediate allocation so just think about the estimated wall clock time and accordingly you will select uh, the parameter that is very very important otherwise your job will be waiting for a long time in the queue the another parameter is required resources say for example most of the bioinformatics applications actually used to run a single threaded if you are using 14 thread or 64 thread though you are actually allocating 64 cpus your job will be running on only one cpu remaining 63 cpu will be ideal so just ensure that you are using appropriate resources for your job allocation um, for your application requirement uh, as i can uh, shared previously the fast qc is one of the file it actually uses multi threaded using minus tt threads option right there we need to put a specific parameter 16 thread otherwise right by default it will be using one thread remaining though i am actually allocated 64 cores or 64 cpus it will be unused because the resource parameter should be mapped or should be aligned with the application parameter i have a short video i will show you how to balance between these two parameter uh, after this presentation i will show you a short demo uh, how to use <coughs> Yes. Sixty-four task in one CPU. Yes. No, it will be still no, because if you can actually see CPU per task, the CPU is capable of the CPU is actually present within the node or across the node. That is also possible. By default, if you are not specifying dash dash nodes, it will be allocated within the node. If you specify dash dash nodes is two, two nodes will be allocated sixty four each on two different nodes. So again, you need to think about your application parameter whether I am going to run across the node or within the node, right? Assume that if you are running a yeah, machine learning jobs or MPA based jobs, I will be scatter my application across one node to another node. Then it's good to specify nodes two, CPU per task sixty four. so total you will be allocating 64 times of 2 128 cpus you will be allocated your job supposed to be run on 128 cores across node otherwise assume that i am actually using a sequential application i am allocated two nodes with 64 cpu each though i am actually allocated 128 core i will be running one core then remaining everything will be you no know, uh, unused so just to ensure that you are mapping the required resources appropriately for your application parameter to increase your productivity uh, this slide actually like addresses your question one node how many threads i will be using cpu per task this example you can actually see here i am using one node cpu per task 32 meaning is my thread will be 1 to 32 thread the second example i will be using nodes to n task 64 n task per node 32 meaning is total 64 cpus i am looking for but each node 32 so this accordingly so based on your requirement you need to select the parameters 
So uh, BWMM is one of the alignment algorithm. It's very famous in bioinformatics. So for example, here I specify CPU part task 16. The 16 thread should be mapped with this application parameter, thread 16. Otherwise, right, the BWMM by default, it actually, actually uses only one thread. If you are using CPU per task 16, the number of thread supposed to be 16. Otherwise, we may not actually use all the allocated resources for your application. So just to ensure that your application parameter should map or should uh, follow the resource requirement. That is very, very important to speed up your process, speed up your job. Then one more thing is don't override uh, your resource requirement. Here, say for example, I specified, I specified the CPU per task 16, I used 16, that is perfect. Then if I actually override CPU per task 32, but internal application actually uses only 16. Say for example, over the job script, I modified CPU per task 32, but if you can actually see the command line parameter of the application, still it actually uses only 16. Though you are increase the resources 16 to 32, the application still uses only 16 threads. So you may not get the speed up or the improvement. In order to avoid this kind of scenario, you can actually use number of thread become a variable parameter that is called as slow underscore CPU per task. The slow underscore CPU per task gives you a variable parameter. This variable is mapped with the runtime option. Either it is 32 or 16, whatever you are passing on a command line argument, this value will map with the variable, thereby you may not worry about the resource allocation versus your application parameter. So just ensure what parameter you are using on the resource allocation followed by your application. So uh, as a simple, um, for any clarifications or request or help, you can write us ibex at hpc.coast.edu.sa is a common email ID as part of the ticket. You can actually describe more details. Say for example, if you are providing insufficient details, my job is failed, can you help me out? as a simple word or without any explanation, we may not possible to um, understand your requirement. So we actually looking for more problem descriptions. Say for example, my job script is this, my data set is a common data set or whatever. My application is failed because of so-and-so error. It's good to attach the error log, good to attach the script file. Then right, you can actually give more description. Then it's possible to understand your uh, requirement and understand uh, your problem and possible to help out. Uh, if you are giving insufficient details, it's very difficult uh, for our follow-up. Uh, so on our ticket, please write more description and more explanations, then write it's very good for us to understand the problem and try to help you out where the problem is coming from. Uh, so uh, some of you may not uh, familiar about writing your job, own job script. So we have a customized tool called um, job script generator. It is available from hpc.coast.edu.sa slash ibex slash jobs. There you can actually select um, or generate your own job script. Maybe um, I can actually show you a small demo. Let's say for example here, Ibex. You can see here my Ibex job script generator. In this job script generator, you are feel free to actually select any of the architecture. Say for example, AMD ROM. You can see here the constraint AMD ROM is added here. So for example, I'm actually like looking for 100 TB memory. Here 100 TB memory is added. So 100 TB is not actually available, but the generator actually gives you whatever you are looking for, right? Uh, maybe GPU, RTX, 
automatically generate. So what you need to do, you need to copy the resource parameter and customize based on your requirement. So most of our training materials um, available in this training tab, the previous presentations and some of the useful informations available on the training tab. So, and finally, uh, this is our contact uh, channel. So the website is uh, hpc.cows.edu.se slash ibex. Then the Slack channel is also available for uh, use. And this is the common uh, email ID, right? Any questions or any doubt, any clarifications? Uh, on Zoom, any questions or yeah, maybe the last I will run a small video. So say for example, the job monitoring and control. Uh, this is actually again related with PASQC. Once you submit your jobs, job monitoring, once job monitoring done, uh, it will be executed on the compute node as already explained by Mohsen. You can see the standard output file and standard error file will be uh, generated, right? Then you can actually monitor the job. Say for example, here, this is the important parameter. If it is actually multi-threaded, these two parameters are supposed to be balanced. So here I'm using 16 thread and 16 number of CPU task. So here, sorry. So this is the one. CPU per task 16 and FastQC is supposed to use 16 thread. So this CPU per task, whatever you are assigning, that should be matched with number of threads. Then your resource optimization and speed up will be good. That is my uh, key point wanted to convey in order to improve uh, your performance of your running job. Uh, by default, it is one CPU. A command line, the fast QC, uh, say so for example, if you are using fast QC, this is the command line. By default, if you are not specifying number of thread 16, it will be used by default number of thread developed by um, the uh, develop based on the developers. Either it may be a one thread or six thread. I don't know what actually hard coded in the source code. Yes, you can actually see more CPUs, whatever you want. It should be mapped with uh, CPU per task. You cannot assign more than one CPU. Huh. It's not uh, CPU per task, right? No, he's asking for hyper threading. Oh, hyper threading. Okay, hyper threading uh, by default it is disabled. Yeah, by default it is disabled on the hyper threading parameter. Yeah, sorry, thanks, Musa. If you want to understand me, you can ask for two. Logical CPU. Yeah, because hyperthreading is completely different. But here, here, in at least IPEX, we are not following. Thanks, Musan. The reason is actually because of, say, for example, most of them throughput-based jobs. That's the reason we are not actually enabling hyperthread options. And moreover, AMD is different because AMD is the one actually came up. It doesn't support hyperthreading, right? So, any questions or any feedback? In case if you are actually looking for uh, some dedicated uh, session or um, like uh, clinic, for example, I'm having some issues or the ongoing work on my production cycle, uh, please feel free to send uh, as part of the ticket or training at 
the same email training at hpc.coast.edu.sa. We will actually like look for our available slot, both of us uh, to work together on resolve any one of the issues. You can actually create your own request um, by ticket, IBEX, ticket, training, whatever. Uh, that's all currently I have. Thanks for your time and thanks for your looking for your feedback and anything else. Yeah, thank you all. Have a good day. Yeah, <laughs> thank you all. Yeah. It's disconnected. Thanks all.